Welcome to Mount Sinai Future U, a show highlighting innovations and research at Mount Sinai that are changing patients' lives. Mount Sinai is making history by training the next generation of doctors to perform transgender surgeries. These fellows are not only changing lives through medicine, but they're also providing a safe haven to transgender individuals who have felt excluded in society. This is probably my favorite. I was uh, traveling through Europe and then I went to South Africa and I became a supermodel before as a boy. And I just felt so uncomfortable. Um, when I came back to America, I was climbing the ladder and um, I said I didn't want to repeat the same thing that had happened in South Africa where I was trapped into this career where I was excelling but I was not really particularly happy in my private life. You can make a lot of money and, but that doesn't bring you happiness. You know, so I decided that I chose happiness and almost chose like poverty because I walked away from an excelling modeling career. And people, some folks just don't quite get it. You know, they say, oh, you're so handsome. You're, you're working, you're, you know, you're in cigarette ads, you're in commercials, you're on TV. Why would you give that up to be on welfare? But I was happy. Transgender patients face a great deal of discrimination. Many doctors who won't take care of transgender patients, or if they're willing to, they don't know how to. This is a very at-risk population in regards to psychiatric care. Up to 40% of the individuals who are transgender or gender non-conforming have experienced a suicide attempt in their lifetime. You know, many trans folks have actually been disowned by their family members. They've been thrown out into the streets. When friends find out you actually want to transition, they kind of will slide away, sort of drift away slowly and you find yourself in this place where you just sort of isolate. There's something very special about the fellowship at Mount Sinai, you know, it's, it's kind of like a safe haven, you know, for us, you know, it's a place we didn't have physically before to, to go to. And now it's one of the last places that we can go to, you know, when the world is just like beating us down because our physical characteristics does not match up with everyone's standards. They yes, actually give us a level of care that is like above and beyond. We're never denied the services, you know, where they always make time. I don't know how they make time for so many millions of people that actually need this type of care. We wanted to create a fellowship where we could train the next generation of surgeons, right? It's just me, it's just one surgeon. There's only so much that I can do. Up until now, there hasn't been a fellowship, so this is the first. There were no formal training programs in transgender surgery. I was very fortunate when Dr. Just Ting contacted me, inviting me to uh, apply for the fellowship, which had just been approved. I feel very lucky to be here. One new surgeon every year will come out of this program and we'll be able to multiply our expertise and what we do in trying to improve those healthcare disparities. There will be a psychiatry fellow who will primarily work at our outpatient center working with Dr. Arroyo, taking care of the many psychiatric and mental health needs of our patient population. I'm always excited to be on the cutting edge of medicine, and that's exactly what's happening here at uh, Mount Sinai's Transgender Center. What we're doing now is providing wraparound services for a community who before had trouble reaching doctors at all and now they're able to come to one center and get primary care, surgical services, as well as mental health services. I feel in my heart that this is going to set a wave of other programs following suit in knowing that there is a need to specialize in transgender health and to be able to provide that through education and, and to educating not just uh, somebody at the level of a fellow, but at the level of a resident, at the level of a medical student. Trauma starts for a trans person that's not in the right body. Um, initially in the morning, right when your feet hits the floor, just to actually physically get dressed, look at yourself in the mirror, it's very, very challenging. It's much more than just um, a cosmetic change. It's a struggle for us to just exist on a daily basis. This gives a place for us to go to the, where the doctors give us that love and that care to, you know, where we're able to get the surgery now, where it just changes your self-esteem and it just 
makes you a go-getter. You know, you're no longer isolating anymore. It's, it's just a very, very, very social place. And it's, it creates a kinship between you and the practitioners because it's like family. And now is what you see is the explosion of the trans community because of the surgery is allowed us to basically be all of me. Transplant surgery is life changing. And that's especially true for one liver transplant recipient who's grateful for the gift she received two decades ago. Now at the time, advanced age liver transplant was rare. Today, she's showing her appreciation to the family of her donor. Meeting my donor's family has been incredible because I've been able to thank them in person for giving me life, for giving me a new lease on life, for allowing me to see my sons go through grade school, to go through high school, through college. My sons are now working members of society, so I was able to thank them for that, for giving me life. When I was 18, 19 years old, I was diagnosed with a genetic liver disease called autoimmune liver disease. As time went on, um, the liver became worse and um, I did finally get cirrhosis of the liver. Dr. Bach was the doctor that took care of me pre-transplant. She was the one that determined that I did need a transplant. Like any other autoimmune disease, the body looks at something as foreign, so there was an attack or assault on her liver and ultimately led to liver failure and complications of liver disease where if she didn't receive a new liver, she would have not made it. I had my successful liver transplant here at Mount Sinai uh, almost 21 years ago. The liver that I received from Geraldine in Dallas, Texas, my donor mother, was 76 years old when she passed of a cerebral hemorrhage. So if you add the numbers, 76 year old liver, 20 years later, my liver is 96 years old and I'm doing phenomenal. So if you think about it, in four years, my liver's gonna be 100 years old. The risk to benefit was that she wasn't going to get a liver because of the way the system worked and because there's a shortage of livers. And so um, a decision was made with her consent um, to use a liver that was a little older than the standard liver at a time where we, that we didn't really know 100% that older livers were going to perform or make it all the years. You don't know when the next liver is going to come and what kind of liver it's going to be. And, and unfortunately, it's a reality that not everybody gets a liver or makes it. So she made she made a obviously a wise decision, but a difficult decision at the time that this might not have been the perfect liver. We have uh, long been leaders in pushing these limits, mostly because our patients are in such need. And if we waited for the 20-year-old perfect donor, but the reality is that that represents less than 10% of the potential donor pool. So if we all waited for that, we would do a fraction of the transplants and many more people would die. So we've always been about pushing the limits. So originally we thought you can only use a liver from somebody who's under the age of 55. And then we pushed it and realized you could use a liver from somebody who is under the age of 65. And actually today, we can use livers even from people in their 80s and possibly in their 90s. At the time Denise was transplanted, using a 76-year-old liver was among the oldest ever used and it was considered uh, undoable. But reality is that the liver is a privileged organ. It can repair itself. Unlike any other organ, it can regenerate and regrow. And the liver doesn't age the same way as a kidney or a lung or any of our other organs. Denise is a pretty special woman and obviously an advocate for herself, but also an advocate for people in her situation. Um, she's been my go-to person when I have a patient that I need to start talking and preparing for liver transplant because she just has such a positive attitude. She's just a really good role model. When I met my donor's daughter, Rebecca, she filled me in a lot about Geraldine, my donor, and it was uncanny because there were a couple of coincidences that we had and that we both grew up the first decade of our lives in an orphanage or foster homes. A donor and the recipient both graduated from nursing school at an age of 52 years old. And it makes you think like, gee, 
this must have been meant to be, or there's something, you know, the odds of that are incredible. For many people, it's very therapeutic to meet the people whose lives were saved from their loved one's unfortunate event. For them, suffering through a, a tragedy, whatever it is, especially when the, it's unexpected or the donor is young, I think there's a lot of comfort in knowing that those organs saved somebody else's life. It was probably one of the most incredible experiences in my whole life. Her mother gave me life, so we're like sisters. We consider ourselves like sisters, and who ever would have expected that? A standard donor can potentially give up to nine organs, so and then can save potentially 50 other people with tissue and bone. So there's a lot of good that could come from one donor. The success of transplant in general has led to broadening of the indications for transplant. We've pushed the limits with age. We've pushed the limits with comorbidities. We can use livers from people with things like diabetes and hypertension. And more recently, we've pushed the limits even further. We actually can take livers from people who have been infected with certain viruses and offer them to people already infected with those viruses. And so we are constantly looking at ways to increase the pool of donors, utilize every organ that is available because our need is so great. From advanced age liver transplants to liver transplants in newborns, neonatal hermochromatosis is a liver disease that can lead to death within weeks or even months after birth. There isn't much hope without a liver transplant. In our next story, Dr. Sandy Florman shares Matilda's story. Could you ever think that you would be able to give a five-week-old her entire life back when it was limited to days. I love talking about Matilda because it shows what's possible and that's what transplant's about for me. It's about hope. Matilda was born and she seemed healthy. They'd sent us home from the hospital, but it was just a couple days after I took her home and she started to seem very lethargic. Things didn't feel right. This is a very rare disorder and most children who get the severe form like she had die within weeks or months of being born. The idea that we could consider liver transplantation in someone who's only three kilograms and then find a donor. For me personally, on this case, the emotions were high. There was trepidation, honestly. But I don't say that lightly. I did not want to give them false hope, but without a liver transplant, there was simply no hope at all. You're talking about a liver that we got from a two-week-old. That liver literally fit in the palm of my hand. A tug the wrong way, a cut, a cautery injury could be a disaster for the entire transplant. We were able to take that child's organs and bring it back for Matilda and do what would easily be one of the most complex transplants I've ever done. I remember vividly um, being with the family and uh, they were saying goodbye. Not goodbye, we'll see when the operation's over. Goodbye, probably goodbye, goodbye. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, well, let's see if we can change that. We have to make some major connections to the big vein that takes the blood back to the heart. We have to connect the artery to her aorta, the largest artery in her body. We have to connect the bile duct to her intestines, all with microscopes, with sutures as fine as your hair, sewing together blood vessels that are just a few millimeters in diameter. Just a couple stitches in each. There's so much risk for bleeding or clotting and failure. I just kept looking at her and thinking, my baby just had a transplant. Like, that's wild. And she's gonna survive. Matilda is five and a half, so she's about five and a half years post-transplant, and the prognosis looks good. She is in kindergarten, and she fits right along with her classmates. 
There are not many places that would even dream of taking on a liver transplant in somebody this size. This is not something that's possible in most major academic hospitals. You really have to have the experience, the team, the conviction to do a, a case like this. It's really interesting. When we think about our journey at Mount Sinai, it's a really beautiful one. And that's hard to explain to people because we didn't have family here. We didn't have a home here. And so we really relied on the nurses and the doctors to give us that moral support along with the medical support. And they really did, they really came through. Mount Sinai will be a part of Matilda's story, will be a part of our story forever. Imagine if you're a parent and you come into a hospital with your child and you see the grim look on a whole bunch of doctors' faces and they say, I don't know how much longer he or she will live. A miracle is being able to say, but you know, I think there may be a little hope. We're going to do something that few people have ever tried. When you're able to turn that despair into hope, that's a miracle and that's what we do at Mount Sinai. Spending the night in the hospital can be stressful and even draining for both a patient and a patient's family. A new program called Hospital at Home is catering to patients in the comforts of their own homes. The recovery process is less strenuous and also decreases the cost of treatment. This is my father, Manuel Rivera, and um, you know, he's getting older. The body's breaking down a little bit. It's always like in the process of trying to get better health care for, for him. He had developed a heart condition which uh, the valves were clogged and so as a result they had to do a catheterization with a stint and he was in the hospital for about a week and so when he got out of the hospital rehab within like a week he developed, um, he ended up going back to emergency. He had developed pneumonia and then at that point, um, the mobile hospital, they got in contact with us to see if it was okay for him to, you know, to, to use that system. MAC stands for the Mobile Acute Care Team, and that's what we call our hospital at home program. We're really replacing a hospital admission. Most of our patients meet, uh, meet us in the emergency room when the emergency room doctor has determined that they need to be admitted to the hospital. And then we come in and offer our services instead, where the patient comes home with us and they have doctor's visits, nurses' visits, oxygen, IV antibiotics, oral antibiotics, everything that they would need in the hospital, labs, x-rays, ultrasounds, and we do all of that at home. I feel like with my father, he wanted to be home. So he got home and he was also reassured with the constant quality of care that it was be, his care was being addressed. He's in his, his familiar surroundings. People could come to visit him from the building. And I didn't have to be in the hospital the whole time, which was kind of like very stressful going in and out of the hospital. I felt like the MAC program kind of um, got him back to his feet. We've seen over 600 patients uh, since the program's inception. Over that period of time, the readmission rate to the hospital has been cut in half. Patient satisfaction outcomes are about 20% higher, and the overall cost of delivering the care is 20 to 30% lower. And one of the things that's been a challenge for other organizations that have had programs focused on hospital level care at home is the integration of the clinical, the operating, and the financing model. What's unique about where Mount Sinai is going is we've actually found a way to create a payment model around that, and we've been testing that through the, the prior demonstration. Contessa has built an entire business on figuring out the payment and the operating model for hospital-level care at home and how that ties to the clinical model. The goal of our partnership was to combine our areas of expertise and enable to make this program available to any patient that has uh, commercial insurance or a Medicare Advantage coverage. No one is really focused on how to deliver hospital-level care in a different manner, and that's exactly what our partnership does. We're reinventing the care model. Not only are we delivering care differently, but we're also being reimbursed for it in a different manner. We receive a prospective bundle payment, so that's one lump sum payment up front, and we in then turn pay all the downstream providers from that payment. 
here at Mount Sinai. I hope that we're going to be able to offer this to all the insurances that Mount Sinai takes. But in addition, we'd like to be able to stand this program up all over the country. It was like when they came, they would give them that one-on-one. That -on -one. Having the MAC program come into our lives was really a godsend. Recovering from foot surgery can be challenging. A person may struggle to walk, run, or even dance. But with new technology, doctors are performing a minimally invasive surgery that allows patients to return to their normal lives faster than expected. This is so exciting. This is a revolutionary surgery for the foot to address bunions, arthritis of the foot, diabetic foot, flat feet. It really cuts recovery time in half. There's so much less pain compared to the traditional open surgeries and patients are able to return to their normal life uh, sooner than they expect. I have high arches and my mother had bunions and bunions can be hereditary and also physical and I have both. So around 24 I really started developing bunions, that kind of pain is constantly taxing your patience, your sleep, your energy level. You know, it's hard. This wasn't just affecting my personal daily life, it was affecting my work life. I'm an actor and I tend to play characters who get put in high heels and it was painful. And again, I would just have to grit and bear through it. I went to a foot doctor and I looked into the old-fashioned bunionectomy and I was like, forget it, no way. And it's, you know, on the scooter and it's on the crutches and you, it's months and months and I just, I, my life couldn't deal with that then. So for 16 years, my bunions and other issues, it de then I developed a hammer toe from the bunion and nerve issues. I had one year where I could only wear Crocs. So I googled new bunion surgery question mark and up popped an article about Mount Sinai and Dr. Volcano. The procedure is called a percutaneous surgery which is extremely minimally invasive. You achieve the same thing that you would achieve through a, a big incision through very very little tiny holes. So this is a traditional incision with open surgery. You make a long incision over the side of the foot and occasionally you need to add another incision over the top of the foot. Whereas with the percutaneous procedure you're making four or five very tiny incisions. You are able to walk immediately after surgery. It's fantastic because, especially women, they can return to wearing their high heels uh, very early. Most of my patients are able to return to running, yoga, dancing, already at about six, seven weeks after surgery, which was really unheard of. When I was scheduling the surgery, I said, I have a red carpet event the day after that night. You're telling me I can go? And he's like, yeah. So when I had the surgery, it was seamless. The next day, I woke up and I realized I will be able to go to the movie premiere tonight. It was about 24 hours later. The hundreds of cases that I was already able to do, the success rate has been unbelievably high. Bunion surgery, not what you think it is. So much easier than we've known it to be. This is a completely different surgery. It's a totally new option. It's an honor. As a doctor, I want to make patients feel well and enjoy their life. And being able to do so with a new technology is exciting. It's also humbling at the same time. Radiation therapy can be stressful and exhausting, but new research shows that music therapy is making the treatment process more tolerable for cancer patients. It's also helping patients with back pain and other ailments. Researchers share the results from a first-of-a-kind study. We have been looking at pain for many years and, and how to best treat pain. Music therapy is a, a natural entry point because we're so musical. Our heart beats in rhythm. When the body is in dis-ease, those rhythms are off. And if we can use the natural qualities of music in music therapy and help people realign, then that's, I think, what we bring to the medical care of patients going through pain. So we were trying to look at music therapy as an intervention occurring within the therapeutic relationship between a therapist 
and an individual going through recovery from spine surgery. We take deep breaths, we create this real cleansing. We showed quite a, a difference of reporting from the patients who received music therapy, almost a point in fact. With live music, we tailor the music to what's happening with the individual, their breathing, degree of pain, how it's presenting in the body. We can match that music, something that recorded music just can't do. The remarkable thing about music therapy is that people that don't deem themselves musical at all benefited from this. Everybody knows that music makes you feel good. We use it at ball games. We use it before wars. It builds resilience. But what really hasn't been critically studied is the use of music therapy in radiation, where you go in this dark space by yourself and you can't have someone accompany you. I couldn't move and you had to be relaxed and think about something else. You can't think that this, the radiation is going through your body. The study looked at music therapy intervention to address state anxiety and distress in newly diagnosed cancer patients who were receiving something called simulation for radiation therapy. It was something that patients had specified as being one of the most anxiety producing moments of their entire treatment. There's very few therapies out there that actually hook into the cultural preferences by knowing a patient's favorite music, being able to program it during the simulation. We see a lot smoother simulation treatment. Music is analyzed. We figure out the tempo and the complexity of the music and then the, the music that the patient likes is arranged in the sequence that is going to uh, likely invoke a relaxation response. I noticed after the music therapy session that, that I was much more relaxed. It is something that is very personal that is going to affect you uh, mentally and physically and it's going to help you through the treatment. We were able to show without a doubt that music therapy decreased anxiety. Thank you for watching Mount Sinai Future You. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter where we will post updates for our next episode.